for the invitation to come and speak here and uh, uh, say how honoured I am to be part of this uh, event. Uh, when I was president of PSI, and indeed when I was a, a, an early graduate of psychology, I look forward to, well, I don't look forward per se to being a late graduate of psychology, but in due course, uh, that time will come to us all. But when I was an early graduate of psychology, it was um, 25 years ago, so it's, uh, it's actually, uh, if, 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 if you think Brendan looks um, like a spring chicken, um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, I've often uh, wished for grey hair, actually, just so I could get a bit of respect from, from some <laughs> But um, uh, it's fantastic to be here, and I, I, I hope uh, what I have to say is, is, of, is of interest. Um, I thought I would try to be provocative, and I uh, thought I would try to be a little bit um, uh, far-reaching. And, um, and nonetheless, I've managed to compress my slides into a seven-second vine, and I've just pushed it on the vine. So if you want to have a quick look there, you can uh, sort of see where I'm going with everything. But I want to talk about the point of psychology and how it gets missed. And I suppose um, there are various uh, reasons for doing this. Um, so let me see, I've got my slides behind me. Um, uh, people often have, and psychology graduates are very well acquainted with the various stereotypes that psychologists are um, uh, faced with. Um, uh, but I thought it, this uh, sort of joke came up at one point. I do promise a joke in the abstract, so I'm obliged <laughs> to do a bit of research. Uh, but I came up with one of my own. Uh, so <laughs> the, the classic of the kind of this is this um, psychologist as therapist version. Uh, of things, um, but my one is slightly different. There is another version that I also found uh, playing on the theme, but I thought it was kind of streaming through consciousness a little bit too much here. Um, but my one, <laughs> my one relates to how many psychologists it takes to change a light bulb. And I did. I, I have a more or less health psychology background, and uh, I originally thought of this as a health psychology one because people often have to answer the question. Well, you know, psychologists aren't really qualified to do that. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, there are various, uh, <laughs> there are various alternative uh, uh, approaches that we can take. As psychologists, we're often um, uh, lateral in our thinking and trying to sell ourselves to, to whoever it is who might do the buying. Okay, so in relation to um, education <laughs> and, and being an early graduate of any discipline, I, I really particularly like this uh, cartoon because it, um, it captures something I think quite serious, and that is that relates to the group think that is associated with uh, an educational model. And psychology is very proud of itself, um, and that's good. Uh, psychology is, values itself quite a lot, and that's also good. But of course, if you take those things to extremes, you can enter a realm of sanctimony and look down on other disciplines and on other people who aren't in your discipline in various ways. So we end up maybe being loyal to our discipline in a way that poses certain challenges because we become, we become blind to its faults. Um, and we play on, maybe we take advantage or end up receiving advantage of other people's relative ignorance of what it is that we actually do. And people come to psychologists and, and, and with a kind of awe and we, we're essentially just recycling a, a, a narrative or a discourse that we've been taught in education, and who knows whether it is actually what, as good as we think it is. So uh, I do like the cartoon, I think it's quite funny, and of course we're all there with our, our certificates on the wall, and myself, myself included. Um, so what I thought I would talk about is, is really what is the point of psychology, and does the educational model of psychology capture that, or does it miss that? And are we sometimes too obsessed with the kind of literal structure of what a textbook version of psychology is, as opposed to what psychology um, originated as, as a, as a phenomenon of human culture? Um, and so I'm going to give you an outline. <laughs> All right. So the question, is psychology a therapy? Um, we're going to look at that, and I, I, we explore an answer to it. Um, <laughs> is psychology a guide to good behavior? Now, just if you bear with me, I've actually pumped the slides here, but I want to have a reflection here, so I'm just going to double up on my, um, so I don't have to keep looking around behind me, because that's going to get awkward. Oh, this is still behind me, isn't it? Okay. Um, that's not. Okay, now I can see where I'm going. Right. So is psychology a guide to good behaviour? We often hear people talking about positive behaviours and ways of increasing positive behaviours and ways of decreasing negative behaviours and reinforcing this and that. Um, is psychology a means of achieving the good life uh, or a virtuous discipline? So is it an intrinsically good thing? Uh, many years ago there was, a, I think, a special issue of the 
Irish psychology or Irish journal psychology around is, is, is psychology a questionable behavior or is psychology a dubious endeavor? Something along those lines. And then finally, you know, what, what actually is psychology? <laughs> what, what's the, if, you, if you take away all of those things, you know, what's, 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 what's left? All right. Now, so is psychology a type of therapy? This is the classic cliche, this is the so-called, and it is a cliche in its own right, what the taxi driver says to you when you tell them uh, that you're a psychologist. And it's always, you know, can you help me with my problems or read my mind and so forth. But is the psychologist as therapist is a very strong model, and very often uh, I encounter psychology students who have a strong commitment to helping people as a future career, and that's really why they're into psychology. Uh, but is psychology actually a type of therapy in the pure form of psychology? And one thing to bear in mind is that if you look at this historically, you will see that the psychotherapies and the psychotherapeutic professions pre-existed modern psychology, coexisted alongside modern psychology, and only in relative recent times have become under the umbrella of psychology as, as an integrated part of the discipline. And this continues to pose problems um, of a certain kind today, where the psychotherapist sees themselves as doing a very different job and a very fulfilling a different role to uh, a psychologist, ostensibly in the same discipline. Uh, the picture on the left relates to um, uh, what barber shops used to look like back in the olden days, uh, where you could, as well as getting your hair cut, you get your teeth pulled, because dentistry originated as a back street service uh, from a barber shop, and that explains why the red and white uh, pole is the symbol for barber shops around the world today because they used to hang the red and white rags, the bloody rags, in their windows as a way of, as a sign to tell you where you could get your teeth pulled and your hair cut. And not only the haircuts remain, thankfully enough. <laughs> um, and it is an interesting uh, theme in its own right because you could ask the question if something originated as a separate discipline, does that necessarily mean it should remain a separate discipline today? Uh, and, and psychotherapists sometimes take that view. Psychotherapy is an independent, autonomous discipline with its own history, so psychology should keep its distance. But that doesn't necessarily follow, because dentistry is reasonably and appropriately a healthcare profession now. Uh, we don't expect uh, to, to get our teeth pulled in the barbershop anymore. So the history is there, and it's, it's interesting and it's respectable, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what we should do today or in the future. So when we have people look at, um, at psychotherapy, um, you might be aware that they've encountered an issue relating to, okay, psychotherapy originated in various um, uh, manners uh, historically um, uh, and, and prehistorically um, in terms of shaman culture. Anthropologists will talk about the mental health role uh, that shamans had in, in, in prehistoric civilizations and early civilizations. So psycho psychotherapy is there, and it's only recently that psychologists have gone to look at it over the last uh, 75 years or so. And when we use our empirical psychology methods to see how, psych how psychotherapy works, uh, people encounter what they call the dodo bird problem and the dodo bird conjecture. So at Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, there was a, a, a brief episode where the dodo bird had tried to organize a race. It was a very poorly organized race. Nobody knew who won the race. And therefore, the dodo bird said, uh, everybody has won and all must have prizes. And the statistically minded psychologists who looked at the literature on psychotherapy concluded that all psychotherapies must have prizes because they're all equally effective. And the way they operationalized that was by imagining if you took every single two psychotherapies and compared them to each other, what would the average difference be? And if the dodo bird conjecture is true, the average difference would be zero. And therefore, there would be a lot of zeros if you looked at all possible pairs. And if the dodo con bird conjecture was false, then the, the average effect size would deviate from zero because some therapies would be better than others, and you'd have the lower line there. And when, this, when you actually look at the literature with that strategy in mind, um, uh, the dodo bird conjecture appears more true than false. Uh, and without getting into, and remember this is wrong in mine, but without getting into all the microscopic details, uh, you can see that um, our, uh, the, 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 the statistical modeling showed that with overwhelming probability, uh, these effect sizes um, uh, did, did not um, uh, deviate from zero. And, and the overall average difference between two therapies was an effect size somewhere region, in the region of zero to 0.21. And a coincidence of 0.21 equates to 1% of variance, which means that 
The average difference between two psychotherapies is 99% uh, of the time there is no difference, and 1% of the time you can say there's a difference between the therapies. That's a terrible explanation for that, but it helps capture, in a nutshell, the minuscule scale of, of, of the difference between two therapies. So all must have prizes. In other words, if you have a behavior therapy or a cognitive therapy, the outcomes are going to be the same on average across a sample of patients. And that tells us very interesting things about behavioral theory and cognitive theory, uh, because they distinguish the two therapies. Um, if 1997 wasn't recent enough for you, you can always reflect back to 1979. I think many of you will not have been born here. But there's a very interesting study back, back there, and you never get to do it today. And so Strupp and Hadley's study was famous at the time, and, and it's still relevant, I think, for our, 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 our thoughts. This is the study where they recruited a bunch of academics to pretend to be psychotherapists uh, in a university counseling service and sent clients to them uh, and followed them up after therapy, after 25 hours of therapy each and after a year. And there were professors of history, of mathematics, of philosophy and so on. And the samples are shown there and the details are shown there, but they, they did proper clinical assessments pre-therapy, post-therapy and then one year later. And they found that the clients recovered uh, as quickly and stayed recovered as well after a year's follow-up when they were seen by a professor pretending to be a psychotherapist than they were when they were seen by psychotherapists who had an average of 13 years' experience behind them. So we see that being trained as a psychotherapist doesn't really matter either. Uh, you're just as useful to a client as, 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 as somebody who has never been trained. Uh, in more modern times, um, we have this idea of a treatment manual because researchers sometimes say, well, you know, we hardly know exactly what's going on in the session. Maybe the treatment being offered isn't really the treatment as it says in the tin. So you send someone to a cognitive therapist, they don't necessarily get pure cognitive therapy. So they ask therapists to adhere to a treatment manual uh, so that they can moderate and monitor how well the treatment was delivered in terms of how it was supposed to be delivered. And that allows us, in, in these types of studies, to eliminate any therapy situation where people didn't really adhere to the manual and deliver proper therapy. Um, but other researchers then said, well, you can actually use that as an independent variable. You actually measure how well do people adhere to therapy manuals, and then see, does that make a difference? And so this has been done loads and loads of times. If you're familiar with, um, with meta-analysis uh, results, you'll see that there are lots and lots of studies done to this, um, where people uh, uh, followed treatment outcomes in therapy studies, having taken account of the extent to which the treatment manual was adhered to. And they used the adherence as an independent variable. So the more adherence might be expected to lead to better outcomes if the therapy is, is valuable. Um, the scattered dots to the left and to the right tell you immediately that some of the effects were in one direction, some of the effects were in the other. The bottom line dot, at the, the diamond at the very bottom, is just hovering above zero. And that tells you that across all of these studies, with their sample sizes and their different methods, but nonetheless the collapsed data set, the average effect size was zero. So the association between following the manual, and, and in some studies following the manual made therapy worse. In other studies it made it better, but the overall average was, was zero, it didn't make any difference. Okay, um, <laughs> and then um, uh, people nowadays reflect a little more on, 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 on qualitative dimensions to this. And so they're asking about expertise as a concept. Um, and it's harder to do empirical studies, or quantitative studies at least, but it's interesting that the psychotherapy uh, literature is now grappling with this idea that maybe expertise doesn't matter either. And so the various research studies show that people who know a lot about therapy aren't particularly better therapists. And that the longer you spend at therapy, you're not better at answering quizzes about therapy afterwards. So there are very many situations in the, or aspects of the therapy situation that prevent you from learning. Um, one thing is that the, therapy, the clients for whom therapy doesn't work don't come back. So you only get feedback from the people who, who like what you do. And that's a false kind of feedback uh, in terms of how good you are as a therapist. So there are various ways of looking at this. And the, the therapy community seem to um, are a uh, moot nowadays that um, you know expertise is not a strong factor. So where are we with uh, with therapy? Then I mean, the, the, basically, basically the outcomes. I think these are things that the effectiveness of psychotherapy do not depend on. Does not depend on. Okay, whether the therapist administers one therapy or a completely different therapy, uh, whether the therapist sticks to the instructions for administering the therapy or ignores them, uh, whether the therapist knows what they're doing or, or doesn't, 
and whether the therapist has been kidnapped and replaced by an imposter <laughs> or, or has not. And, and the literature tells us that essentially, okay, we try to help people, we do our best, psychology students really want to do that. Maybe, though, the therapy literature doesn't encourage us to really kind of go hell for leather with it because there, are lots of, there is a lot of ambiguity there. Um, maybe another way of helping clients would be to design a, a, a ten-item questionnaire that would screen people for anxiety. Uh, the hospital anxiety and depression scale has is a very widely used instrument, but it's very damaged in, in terms of its reputation because there are lots of shortcomings with it, psychometrically and otherwise. And there's no alternative instrument. That's the only reason it gets used so much. So if you actually designed a better instrument, you could screen people, and instead of helping maybe 20 people over a clinical career, you might help 200 people every year of your career by ensuring that they get properly screened for a treatment that might work for them if we actually could find one that we could rely on. So, so I often say to students, um, and some of you probably were in classes where I did this, um, you know, why, if you want to help people, why do you want to go out there and touch them? You know, that's not quite helping them necessarily. The research evidence would at least give you pause for thought. Maybe another way of helping them is to stay in your office and do research. Um, and uh, uh, that is equally valid, I would say. So the, the argument that I want to help people, therefore I want to do clinical or psychotherapy, that doesn't necessarily win the argument. You need more than that, because you can help them without doing those things too. So is psychology a therapy? Probably not, really. Uh, let me develop the argument just a little bit. Um, is psychology a guide to good behavior? Um, because a lot of research is, is geared around these things of positive behaviors. Trying to um, uh, increase uh, positive behaviors, enhance uh, the extent to which people engage in certain things. And we have all of these interesting studies using social cognition models, like the theory of planned behavior, trying to find out whether it's what other people think is normal or whether or not I have control over it uh, that makes us wash our hands or not wash our hands. And various, you know, profound um, uh, research ambitions of that nature. Um, and you have all of these um, uh, various uh, behaviors that we might unambiguously say are positive. It's better to wash your hands than not. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with that. Um, but I would argue that when psychology starts talking about this is positive, it's, it's simultaneously talking about something else is negative. And we need to ask ourselves whether we're entering a realm that we can actually substantiate over time because we might be bringing the personal into the professional in that regard, because positivity and negativity is an arbitrary judgment call a lot of the time, and we might end up uh, imposing a norm on other people's moral frame of reference without even thinking about it. So when we look at other uh, positive so-called behaviors that many psychologists try to, there's a very famous sign, and obviously someone's trying to reenact the sign down below, um, smoking. Now, I don't smoke, I used to smoke, but I don't smoke, um, and there's a lot of controversy around smoking. A lot of psychology studies simply say that smoking is bad, and therefore quitting smoking is, is good behavior. Other people will argue there's a civil liberties dimension, there's a pleasure dimension, there's a wider picture here, and maybe smoking is not just intrinsically immoral and intrinsically negative, maybe there's a, there are other ways of looking at it. You can apply that argument to very other, various other things, including giving to charity, which some people say that is counterproductive in certain respects. Engaging in voluntary work, some people say is counterproductive in certain respects. So there, there are debates here, okay? And I'm not saying that it's all black and white. What I'm actually saying is that it's not. And then when you get to other so-called positive behaviors, maybe our Western or our Irish frame of reference will, will help us understand that actually when you declare something positive, you're not always going to be agreed with. So there's also a kind of um, concept in many uh, in the Western world Many um, hundreds of millions of people will adhere to the idea that you shouldn't have sex before marriage or you shouldn't have sex when you're young. Uh, and encouraging positive behaviors involves encouraging people to not do things like that. Um, I'm not so convinced that there's something uh, uh, so dramatically bad about having sex when you're young. Um, it's, a, it's a moral dilemma. And for a psychologist to simply say this is positive behavior, we should encourage it, or to simply call it positive without critiquing or interrogating the term, we might be getting into, into tricky territory. And then when we look at other types of behaviors in the history of psychology, we have uh, the whole question of heteronormativity and the idea that um, heterosexuality is normal and other things are not normal. Now this isn't today or yesterday, this is, uh, this is quite, quite old actually. Uh, on the right hand side there's a, a very poor reproduction admittedly, but it's the only original uh, that I could find um, from DSM-2. Now DSM-2 is quite old, but homosexuality 
was uh, listed as a pathology. Uh, and therefore, it's not a positive behavior. Um, and there was no debate about it. Uh, and this reflected cultural norms in the places where DSM uh, evolved. Uh, but nonetheless, it perpetuated those norms too, because it was seen as a manual uh, to help professionals do their jobs uh, with regard to this, this matter. Uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate student, um, uh, I did say it was 25 years ago, whatever, but DSM-3 was around, and uh, that didn't have homosexuality as a pathology. However, the textbook I was given in this university to study still included homosexuality in the abnormal psychology um, uh, section, in the textbook, uh, and it said things like, um, although it's no longer a pathology, I think we should still talk about it in the context of abnormality um, for various reasons. And you can see from the sentences just above, it was included in the abnormal psychology textbook just after the section on rape, uh, because that's why you're, seeing as we're dealing with this, we might as well talk about homosexuality as well. <laughs> so, so there's this whole lingering heteronormativity and uh, stigmatization of um, uh, homosexuality that, uh, that is interwoven with the idea of positive versus negative. So what I'm saying to you is that positive versus negative is never straightforward, it's always arbitrary, and we must declare it as such and question whether it is right for psychology to do that as opposed to individuals who commission research to do that. Um, and since we're into uh, the, the, the DSM, people would say that's the olden days, but very recently we had DSM-5 in 2013, which is supposed to answer all sorts of problems and homosexuality is long gone. But there are still all sorts of um, uh, artificial and arbitrarily imposed norms around sexuality, and some things are positive, other things are negative. Transvestic disorder is, is classified as a disorder. Um, the one concession they made is that women can have it now as well as men, uh, and it relates primarily to the distress caused by other people uh, harassing you for being a transvestite or for engaging in transvestism. So it, it imposes in the individual uh, a pathology that is actually the result of a socio-cultural attitude. Um, and if you don't encounter that type of hostility from other people, you don't have this pathology. So, so there's a very strange notion of what is positive and what is negative. There's something wrong with you of other people victimizing you. Um, okay, and, and similarly with, uh, with, with gender dysphoria, um, the, the, uh, what they used to call uh, a gender identity disorder. And, and it's, it's funny because they took the word disorder out because they, thought, they said it was stigmatizing. But for transvestic fetishism, they put the word disorder in in order to make it less stigmatizing than fetishism. So, so even that, it's, it's all just kind of what some people think about it. It's not science, it's not, it's not intrinsically right and wrong. And the question I would ask about, um, about, uh, about gender dysphoria and, and, and is, is why is it a psychiatric diagnosis? Um, many people will become distressed about physical aspects of their biological identity if there is a health problem associated with it, but we don't put it into the DSM as a psychiatric disorder. Uh, so gender dysphoria is simply one's distress at a biological aspect of our, of our lives. And lots of biological aspects, including lots of illnesses, are distressing to people without them being um, deemed negative by psychology. Here's another dramatic, uh, and, and in, a, in a funny way it's almost comical, but it is extremely grave as well. And the history of psychology includes a whole set of disorders around African-American uh, slaves who wish to flee from slavery. There must be something wrong with them. So they're suffering from drapetomania, a psychiatric condition. Uh, they want to move north in order to not be slaves anymore. Therefore, they must be recaptured and, 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 and treated for this condition. Uh, so not positive behaviors as declared by psychologists. It's all very, it's all very uh, uh, arbitrary. <laughs> and when we go to um, sources which we might feel are, or we might by reputation understand are maybe uh, uh, have insights to offer on what is moral and what is not moral, um, and they tell us uh, what, what might be positive and what might not be positive, that's not necessarily convincing either. There's no easy way to define what's positive and what's negative. Therefore, it's all about subjectivity, I would argue. And in, so far as psychology is about objectivity, there might be a clash there. Okay. Let me develop the point that's slightly differently again. Um, uh, but the, is psychology a means of achieving good life? Now, essentially what I'm talking about here is positive psychology. I don't have any funny slides, and I only have one slide about positive psychology. I think we might all be reasonably familiar with it. Um, when I joined the APA, it was 1998, and the president of APA that year was Martin Seligman. 
And I, for that reason, I had a certificate on my wall that said idiot, and then I had Martin Seligman's signature <laughs> underneath it. And um, uh, for many years, I, I had that, and I was looking at that. And, and Martin Seligman was the person who uh, uh, announced that positive psychology should be a thing. Okay? And positive psychology was this idea that psychology should stop looking at the negative and start looking at the positive. Um, and he was the man who had developed a lot of research on learned helplessness, which involved uh, electrocuting dogs in cages and, and not letting them escape from the electrocution. And it, he, more than most, perhaps, had a grasp of psychology's obsession with the negative, quote-unquote. Um, and he decided that we should do things differently as a profession, and he almost more or less unilaterally declared the existence heretofore of a new branch of psychology, or what we might even go with a little bit of cynicism, a new brand of psychology, uh, namely positive psychology. And um, the idea is that we can look at things like character strengths and virtues uh, instead, of, uh, instead of sort of pathologies. And we look at the sanities instead of, instead of the, the pathologies. It was one of his quotes. And, 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 and I believe we're all reasonably familiar with the ongoing uh, interest in positive psychology. But there are um, critiques that can be offered as well because it inherently involves identifying positive versus negative. One of the character strengths and virtues in the CSV, which is the 800-page alternative to the DSM that the uh, positive psychologists have published, and Seligman is one of the two authors, is courage. And uh, if you have too much courage, you know, you might find yourself um, in difficulty from time to time because having some fear is an important safety mechanism um, for, for the human organism. Uh, you know, we avoid ravines and predators and various other things. Um, because of fear, and if we had no fear and just courage, um, we wouldn't necessarily have the benefits of positivity in our lives. So anytime we talk about positive and negative, there's always, I guess, that two sides and two, two, two elements of the, of the argument, but positive psychology has been accused of imposing an arbitrary direction on this, that this is all positive, therefore that's all negative, and there isn't too much discussion really about it. But once you impose the discourse of positivity, onto a debate, you're imposing a moral frame of reference, or at least a, uh, an aesthetic frame of reference perhaps, but a subjective frame of reference into what's going on. Um, another criticism of positive psychology is that it tells us we should be happy with our lives and encourages us to use flow and mindfulness in order to achieve happiness, um, uh, despite the fact that we're surrounded by uh, global inequalities, injustices, war, poverty, pestilence, and various other things, and it's not even on a global scale. So we're asked, are we satisfied with life as it is in the Satisfaction with Life questionnaire? And this is the deep end of very lots of studies. We're trying to get it higher because we're positive psychologists. And to answer the, those questions properly means you have to tell the world that you're unconcerned about the fact that we have a, a tax uh, barrier around Europe and people are drowning in boats trying to get in because they're living in poverty. And we're benefiting of this because anyone who earns more than 14,000 euro is among the top 5% of wealthiest people who've ever lived in history. Um, and, and there's lots of people living on a dollar a day, um, but we don't care about it because we're satisfied with life as it is. And we're encouraged if we're not satisfied in life with it is, that we should get satisfied in life with it is. So it encourages people to maybe settle, and it discourages dissent. People who are uh, questioning of uh, hegemony are uh, declared to be um, uh, negative. You're talking negatively because you think the world should be organized differently. So, so, so positive psychology is not without its political criticisms. And then the person-situation controversy is that, you know, social psychologists have, uh, have shown us again and again and again that the situation is hugely important. The culture, the context, the actual predicament in which you find yourself is hugely important. And positive psychology is all about the way you think, the way you do things. And if you want to be positive, that's, that's, that's one variable. But other variables include how other people treat you and, and what adversity you face. And it's all very well telling people they should be more mindful uh, and, and, and achieve flow in order to uh, be more satisfied with life. But if they're an abuse victim or if they're being targeted by uh, discrimination in the workplace, you know, that's not a great uh, consolation to know that you're going to actually do some exercises and be more positive about it. Um, so, um, so the person situation dimensions are lost in a lot of positive psychology as well. So I don't think, I think, I think, um, I don't think positive psychology is necessarily answering the questions we want. In many ways, it's falling into the same traps as Maslow did with the hierarchy of needs model, which is essentially a model of what is valued in an individualistic uh, 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 competitive culture, uh, you know, self-actualization and things like that. 
It all sounds great, but it's open to question. And I'm, that's what I'm saying. Not don't don't go through the path of the cartoon that has idiot this, idiot that, idiot the other. As has been said, it's hugely important that we question society and the norms that are put to us, including within psychology itself. All right. Okay. So let me then um, uh, bring us on to um, uh, sort of to the final stretch, and, and, and maybe closer to home in, in, in a number of respects. Is psychology a virtuous discipline? People think psychology, people, psychologists mainly, I have to say, that psychology is great. It's right on. You know, it's on the right side of all the issues. Um, we, um, uh, uh, we are uh, entering a period of Irish history which is uh, 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 going to be very interesting. 20 years ago, and I was at an event last night in the college bar, actually, in another room, um, a, a reunion of people from 20 years ago who participated in a world record-breaking event. Otherwise, in 1995, we also participated in organizing a big event around the divorce referendum and campaigning for the introduction of divorce to Ireland. And we had people taking to the podiums saying that this couldn't happen because uh, if you, it's a thin end of a wedge. If you allow a divorce, you'll end up with abortion and euthanasia. So for the sake of our unborn and our elderly, we should not vote for divorce. And we ended up with a, 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 a result that was 50.1% in favor of divorce and 49.9% against. And that's, that's how divorce came to Ireland in the late 1990s. Um, it's not that long ago you had this kind of, uh, uh, I suppose, intellectual isolation um, in Ireland um, and this, uh, this sort of moral um, oppression. Uh, we might be revisiting that in a certain way, and I certainly wouldn't take anything for granted here. So we have this discourse emerging in relation to marriage equality about redefining marriage. And it seems to me a lot of people are, are concerned that we shouldn't be admitting to redefining marriage. And those of us who are in favour of, of course I want, must declare I'm in favour of uh, marriage equality, um, I, I'm in favour of redefining marriage. That's the whole point of, of, of voting for marriage equality. In the same way as this uh, very clever tweet put it that Rosa Parks redefined bus travel um, by, by changing the laws uh, around segregation of, of, of the races in, in the southern states in her time. So it's all about redefining. So we're entering an interesting time. And the temptation is for psychologists to naturally assume that they must, because they're psychologists, uh, be on the right side of the issue. And reference is often made to the APA's position, and it's, it's very uh, interestingly worked out position, um, uh, using empirical data and so forth, to contribute to the argument. And the, the lie of the data seems to show there isn't a problem for anybody in relation to marriage equality, and yet um, the very point that APA is putting is construed as not, as not an empirical one, but a political one. So it's not that APA shouldn't do that, but it is obviously going to be mired in uh, partisan uh, attitudes. Okay, so psychology and psychologists will see themselves and often declare themselves to be very liberal-minded. And uh, when psychologists are asked to describe their political views, um, the, uh, it seems that from various studies, an overwhelming majority in most venues and in most samples will say they're liberal rather than conservative, most especially in relation to social uh, liberalism as opposed to economic liberalism. So with social attitudes, psychologists, the vast majority, well over three quarters, say that they are on the liberal end of things. Um, and in the bottom um, uh, table, if you uh, have the time later to peruse it, it's saying that um, in academic departments of psychology, uh, if a conservatively minded candidate applies for a job or is suggested to come and be invited to give a talk, what would you do? And large fractions of psychologists would say that they would, they would uh, discriminate against that person and eliminate them from, from consideration and wouldn't appoint them. Um, and of course, people blame, they say that other people are more likely to do that than me, which is another trend in that. Uh, it's not everybody, but it's about a third of people would, would openly reject a candidate for a psychology job on the basis that they are socially conservative people. Okay, so, so, so psychologists definitely fancy themselves as being uh, right on. Okay, psychologists are, are <laughs> academic. And uh, remember what we said about heteronormativity as, a, as an example, a warning from history, if you like, um, as the Discovery Channel might, might put it. Um, psychology is essentially a white, middle-class, Euro-American, male, um, wealthy uh, discipline. Um, and a lot of what we take as the baseline uh, for anything is from that particular frame of reference. And when you talk about how uh, people uh, thrive or otherwise in psychology based on not meeting that 
rigid stereotype, you find that actually um, a lot of people find psychology to be relatively conservative, or at least to be uh, as conservative as many other academic disciplines. And one of the considerations with uh, all of the excellent uh, early graduates who want to be uh, therapists, uh, a lot of the time uh, the training involves, you know, basically knocking the heteronormativity out of them um, uh, and, and reorienting them and making them more better equipped to empathize with therapy clients. Um, so let's really take it into um, interesting territory. Um, about 10 years ago at Harvard University, the president of the university uh, declared, uh, not declared, he made an interesting enough kind of speech, uh, but you might remember uh, reading about this subsequently or, or in the intervening decade. Um, uh, Harvard University obviously a very illustrious institution and he was asked, uh, even though he's an economist, he was asked to talk about why it was that women don't thrive in academic environments. In other words, why there is an underrepresentation of women in senior academic positions. And he offered a few theories, and this was part of a, a speech, a, a, a sort of a where are we now type of speech, early in the day, early in the year. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what's about a, a, a crew from, from this particular conference today. Uh, but under these types of conditions, he offered the view that, okay, there were three reasons why women are, are, are underrepresented in senior academia. One is uh, the, um, uh, how do you describe it, the um, uh, high power job hypothesis. That for cultural or other reasons, maybe psychological ones, men are more willing to give up um, family life for a high power job than women are. Okay, that's a hypothesis. I'm sure it's possible to investigate and test and so on. His second idea was that uh, men and women's brains do things differently when it comes to mathematics and, and, and stuff like that. Okay, and that men are better. Um, he also said that men are worse. So there are tales of the distribution. So that. Uh, that there, that there are a lot of uh, mathematically inept men compared to women, but there are also a lot of mathematically super talented men in comparison to women. So we offered that cognitive theory. And the third theory then was that there's discrimination. And he concluded that because the first two were true, the third one must be false. And uh, that was his sort of, in a nutshell, uh, there is cognitive difference between men and women, and men are more comfortable doing maths than women. Now he got slated for that, and quite rightly so. It was outside his area, it was uh, uh, ineptly done in certain respects. It was, uh, uh, it ignored a lot of evidence as we will go on to see. So that's an example of a burning social issue that psychologists might have something to say about and um, uh, is, uh, is, is an issue that is, exists in many times and, and many times in many places. But let's see what psychology has to say. Because I'm often struck at some of the discourse in psychology around research methodologies that involve mathematical so here are a couple of, 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 of specially cherry-picked examples. I'm not saying the whole thing is being represented here, but I just want us to think about uh, and challenge our norms. Okay, so qualitative research, what is it? And here is an example from EHAO, you know, that uh, 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 academic source. All right. Um, here's an interesting thing. It says that a qualitative researcher, you are telling the difference between qualitative and quantitative, uh, seeks to become part of the environment she is studying and talks about doing research on gorillas and stuff. Okay, well, a quantitative researcher, on the other hand, will seek to detach himself uh, from the research study and will opt to bring the gorilla into a lab, actually. So, I mean, I, I know of no uh, quantitatively minded researcher in animal behavior who would actually bring a gorilla into a laboratory. But nonetheless, leaving that aside, you see what they did there. Um, they talked about uh, qualitative as, 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 as a she and quantitative as a he. Okay, that's just some website. So when we look at um, uh, qualitative research methods in psychology, or qualitative methods in psychology, published by Open University Press, a mass-produced, um, top-level, academic-published uh, published textbook uh, on the syllabi of degree courses in, in many places. What do they say on, on page two, or uh, uh, the first page of the introduction? I didn't look at the page. Okay, the over-enthusiastic quantitative researcher, who in psychology is often an experimenter, may be content and confident with his results when this has happened, because something has happened. We don't need to go into that. Whereas a qualitative researcher, on the other hand, will be focusing on the context and integrity of the material and will never build her account uh, di uh, uh, directly or only from quantitative data. They've done the same thing, the exact same thing. Now, if nothing is, is in this except an assumption, a norm, a frame of reference that might even have been inadvertently, I might even have been inaccurately done. Maybe they said she and he, but somebody typed it up wrong. 
However, it seems to be coincidental to the stereotype that there's some kind of barrier to women doing mathematics and that leads them to do qualitative instead of quantitative research and then vice versa. I think it's a worrying, implicit stereotype. Also embedded in this is the idea that quantitative researchers are over-enthusiastic, in other words, they're self-conceited and blind to their own faults, whereas the qualitative researchers are focused on integrity. That's, that, that's, their, <laughs> that's their driving force, that's their, that's their objective. About a year after the Larry Summers incident, and unconnected to it, the British Psychological Society published in The Psychologist a report by its Standing Committee on Equal Opportunities um, uh, in Psychology uh, looking at institutional sexism in academia. And they say um, that you know, there is a problem, there is a serious problem, and these are fine academics. I think one of them was a PhD student at the time and has left psychology. The other three are well-known experts, um, very excellent researchers, and know a lot about the field. Um, but nonetheless, embedded within the discourse, there is this idea that peer-reviewed journals, positive epistemologies, and quantitative methods work to reduce women's participation in psychology. And, 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 and likewise, the establishment of a new submitted interest group, or they call it a section of qualitative methods, will be an important forum for addressing this problem of institutional sexism. Now, it's dangerously close to what Larry Summers is saying, because it's, it's implying that it's not discrimination, it's, it's inability to thrive and, and, and maybe there is an inherent discrimination in the system by putting a lot of emphasis on quantitative, but it's indirect discrimination. And it's accidental discrimination. Uh, and it all rests in this idea that uh, women struggle with quantitative, or at least they're less attracted to it, which only begs the question as to why. And, and it implies that there may be a problem there with struggle. And, and there's a lot of research on this. And this, uh, this is how I think psychology should pursue social justice by looking at the data to see what it is is true and what it is is opinion. There's a lot of research on this um, and has led people to conclude something around what's called the gender similarities hypothesis. And this is Janet Shibley Hyde in Wisconsin, uh, who's done an awful lot of work on this. The second paper on the right-hand side is from the most recent annual review of psychology. And we all know that that is a, a compendium of up-to-date, or at least recently updated, uh, gatherings of literature. So it's a very, very useful source, and she hasn't changed her opinion uh, in light of the very latest work. So there's a lot of work showing that there are far more similarities than differences between men and women's cognitive styles, but we are distracted by the differences for ordinary cognitive reasons that we're distracted by things that break a pattern. Uh, so we end up exaggerating in our minds the differences. But most specifically in mathematics, there's a very strong stereotype in lots of countries that there's a gender differences, difference in mathematical ability, but the empirical data simply don't sustain that. Um, it's empirically wrong. And any kind of implication or assumption that there is something in it, and therefore we must build policy around it, and that it may be implicated in gender discrimination in academia, I believe is going, is, is going up the wrong, barking up the wrong tree. And by doing that, it's distracting us from a, a proper solution and a proper identification of the problem. It's this whole very famous cartoon, it's, it's an old concept. That when men flounder in mathematics, we ignore the fact that they're men and say, you're, you're no good. And when women flounder in mathematics, it's somehow seen as, well, it's, it's, it's gender typical. It, 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 it's it's, it's, it's normal, normal within that context. Okay. And I'm going to show you some of the data now, but I'm going to do it in the context of, you know, um, what actually is psychology? What's the point of psychology? What's the place of um, And just to get the, 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 the picture across, um, this is empirical data on uh, mathematics scores in children across the United States. And the extreme right-hand side of the table gives you uh, the sample sizes concerned. In most cases, they're close to a million, and only one case is less than half a million. There are very, very large comparisons between boys and girls, in this case, on mathematical ability. And the effect size is given under the column mark D. The uh, variance ratio we would better understand is the F ratio. Uh, so the Ds there are showing you two things. One is some of them are positive and some of them are negative. So in some of the samples, boys did better than girls, in other samples, girls did better than boys. But in all the cases, the Ds are minute. Remember I said that a D of 0.21 is equivalent to 1% of shared variance. That means that 99% of the problem is to do with something other than what has been studied. In this case, all the Ds are 0 0.0 something. It's absolutely minuscule. There is no empirically recorded difference in mathematical ability between boys and girls right throughout the school system. And when you look at adults doing mathematics, and a meta-analysis combining 400 different samples, giving us 1.2 million uh, adults doing mathematics tests, 
We know in every case what gender they are, we know in every case what maths score they got, and when you actually combine all that together to see is there an association between gender and mathematics, the total effect size is D.05, which is equivalent to 0.0625% of shared variance, which means that 99.9375% of maths performance was to do with something other than gender. So in other words, it, there's no effect there. You, the more time you study it, the more time we find there's no effect. Obviously, the smaller studies will have different random effects in different direct, directions related to methodological issues or maybe just chance. But when you actually put it all together into the same mix, you get that big peak in the middle around zero, a zero effect size. It's the dogo bird effect of maths differences uh, by gender. Everybody does well and everybody does poorly. Okay. So I think that's the way psychology tackles um, uh, 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 inequality issues and social justice issues uh, best. It is by bringing to the table ob uh, objective data that at ver the very least can be independently verified. So people can't say it's just your opinion as to what's positive about the world and what's negative. They can go away and check it themselves. They can have their people look at it. It can be independently verified. So I think it's a very important principle. I'm not saying that psychology shouldn't have opinions, or psychologists, shall I say, shouldn't have opinions. Psychologists absolutely do, because we all work off our own personal frame of reference when it comes to human values. Um, this is a slightly complicated notion, but the, the, it is something that is worth thinking about at the same time. We can con sometimes consider science to work on a linear model, which is that all we have to do is go do studies, and then eventually we know everything. Okay, and we just build knowledge that way. Or we can see science as a stakeholder issue, or a stakeholder enterprise, where we study what we're interested in, and we study what society is interested in, and we study some things more than others. So we have more studies looking at cures for AIDS than we have cures for uh, our treatments for uh, metabolic diarrhea, even though diarrhea kills far more people around the world every day than AIDS does. But AIDS is a very much, uh, the diarrhea kills very few people in the United States or in Europe, and therefore there's more interest in AIDS. So there's a stakeholder dimension to how science works, and we end up knowing more about some things than others because we're interested in that way. And there's also a similar view of democracy. Some people think that all, all democracies work on the assumption that what we want will eventually happen, because we all elect our politicians. Um, but there's an alternative view, which is the top-down view, um, uh, which is, 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 is that we only can vote for what's put in front of us. So what we choose is a function of what the top people want us to choose from. Um, so put all that together. What's the role of the scientist or the social scientist in advising a policy? Well, you can take the pure view that democracy is perfect and that science is perfect and you just go to your lab or your, your, your study group and you do your research. Or you can work all the options. And one of the options is if you acknowledge that, that, that research happens because of people's interests and that democracy happens because we have limited choices to choose from, but we can still choose then you end up with this notion of an honest broker of policy alternatives. That is, a psychologist or a researcher who has a personal opinion on matters, chooses the issues they want to gather the research evidence of, goes to the politicians or policymakers where they would expect to be listened, and tries to push the agenda that way. So it's entirely reasonable for you to have a personal set of values and views and wants, and then to bring psychology to that, maintaining that kind of separation. Okay. Because I think that psychology doesn't have intrinsic values of positivity and negativity and altruism. Many people can use psychology to compete against altruism and to, to do research into why it's good to be selfish and so on. Um, so we, we don't have these intrinsic values. These are the values that people have. Um, and as psychologists, we can have these values, but psychology doesn't necessarily have values of that nature. Psychology does have values of things like integrity and uh, transparency and objectivity. If you're doing psychology right, you have to do it in a way that's, being, that's objectively verifiable. This is, these are the values of the scientific method. It's really just a borrowing um, of, 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 of those types of values. So I'm arguing or provoking this discussion or this idea that psychology, um, uh, it's, it's, it's often said that um, uh, psychology is value free, um, uh, but people who are value free are essentially sociopaths. And, 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 <laughs> and so so you know, it's not always a compliment. Um, so people have values, absolutely. We should acknowledge that. Um, and we should use our science and our psychology in a particular way uh, to defend it against the accusations that it's biased. So we use the psychology values, and they marry each other very well, I believe. So what is the point of psychology? 
I would summarize it as the use of empirical methods to resolve uncertainties in our understanding of the human condition. And empirical doesn't mean quantitative necessarily, it just means empirical. It means things that can be observed by other people to make sure that you're not wrong. Okay, uh, I would say it's like gossip uh, or punditry, where we go around telling people why, why crime happens or, or what we should do about uh, this, that, and the other, except it's got empirical data attached. So unlike the person down the pub telling you that uh, people commit crimes because of uh, they're not brought up properly or they're from broken homes, um, we, can, we, can, we can actually look at that uh, and using empirical data. And it's the empirical data that what's, what makes it psychology and not gossip. Um, and psychology's key strength ultimately is its objectivity. The idea that you can say, take that, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I'm happy for you to check it. You will find I'm right. And that's, that's, that, that's a slight argument in the direction of quantitative over qualitative in the sense that it's easier to verify quantitative data. Now you lose a lot, but you gain that little winning of the argument. Qualitative data is very good for winning hearts and minds. And quantitative data is very good for winning court cases and, and arguments and things like that. Okay. Um, more than that, I'd like to provoke the view that um, every time psychology self-classifies or self-describes as liberal uh, or enlightened, are important. Uh, we're putting ourselves on a pedestal and we're attaching ourselves to a moral frame of reference and we're doing as much to the credibility of psychology in terms of winning those arguments as we would do uh, when, or as, as happens when other people claim that we're Western and masculinist. Um, so by attaching ourselves to a frame of reference or a morality, if you will, um, a moral frame of reference, we're taking a risk with our credibility. Um, is psychology a tool with which to pursue social justice? I passionately, passionately believe that it does, and I would hope that I would have used it in that way myself. Um, but it's, it's me that has the value, not the discipline. Uh, and, and that's the separation I want to emphasize. Um, and in my experience, when, psych when psychologists are just as capable as others as to joining the, 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 the uh, consensus, as an engaging in the groupthink, as engaging in the heteronormativity, uh, is telling us we shouldn't have divorce because. You know, psychologists have done all of these things in my career. Um, being a psychologist didn't make them personally enlightened, in my opinion. And very often they were bad psychologists as well. Um, you know, doing psychology right probably takes you in a direction of the values that I would hold. Um, injustices and inequality are, by definition, terms. They're almost mathematical concepts. You know, this is more than that or this happened in one occasion, but it didn't happen in another occasion. That's what inequality and injustice means. And these are empirical notions, so let's go get some data and test it. Because it's all very well to be a pundit and tell everybody what the way things are, but the psychologist can bring some data to, to bear on the question and help win the argument one way or another. And resolutions to these uh, dilemmas and challenges depend on more and better objectivity, more and better rigor, more and better verifiability, and so on. In other words, more and better science, if you wanted to, to, to really uh, uh, press the red button. Um, but it's more and better of these things, which I think are all defensible and all valuable, uh, rather than less. And so the idea that uh, we should, uh, we should uh, dispense with scientism or scientific methods or move away and be psychologists, not scientists, I think that's exactly what they want us to do. That's exactly what people in powers within homeostatic um, uh, inequalities want, because data disrupts the homeostasis. Data changes things. Data makes you ask why. Um, and for that reason, I think that's the point of psychology. So thank you very much. Time for like two questions. Anyone have one or two? One? <laughs> or anybody who wants to make a, you know, self-referencing monologue comments. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, do so as well. Okay. Uh, it's probably uh, a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Time-wise, anyway.